We'd like to get started it's around six o'clock and we'll do some introductions and uh, set the stage. My name is Tracy Ferdeen and I'm the director of the Center for Global Environmental Education. We've been at Hamlin University for over 30 years and I've been there for 25 of those. Uh, John's been there for, there for 24 as well. Uh, we've uh, stayed steady to our mission of fostering environmental literacy and stewardship in citizens of all ages. Uh, and we've been able to work uh, really and expand our, our, our reach as we've gone from working in the K-12 classroom to developing multimedia tools that can actually uh, are centerpieces of our national parks and uh, NOAA and other locations, fish and wildlife locations around the country. So tonight uh, we are at our final presentation of a new program that we tried out this year. Uh, I would say, suggest it's extremely successful. Waters to the Sea Stories. We always have viewed ourselves as storytellers. And this is a way for us to share what we're doing, to engage with uh, 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 the tools that we have, but also to engage with educators and folks who are supporters of ours around the country. So this is the final one. Uh, we will be starting up again in the fall, but I also wanna give a big pitch to our, our two new institutes, our new our institutes this summer. We'll be virtually going down to New Orleans in June and working in the Delta and then up to Minnesota in the summer in July and explore our, background, our, our backyard in Minneapolis up here in St. Paul. Uh, so tonight, we, as I said, are our final program. It is uh, featuring a, a work that we are very proud of. We started this uh, fall working on this uh, uh, and we have been moving forward with a great team of folks. Uh, we're going to be looking at the um, uh, the conflict of uh, confluence of cultures, uh, exploring Dakota lands and water. And this is a, a collaboration with the National Park Service, the state of Minnesota, Walk on TP, Hammond University, uh, other folks, really an awful lot of other folks. And it is a tool that can be used in the classroom, uh, but it can also be used and will be used on our outreach tables and on our website. So it really is a marvelous way to uh, engage and learn about uh, our backyard. Uh, to do this, we're going to follow the format that we've developed, which uh, features uh, uh, a little bit of uh, John Shepard will be talking about our interactions. Well, I think we don't need that. There we go. Uh, John Shepard will be talking about our interactives. And we have two content experts coming in with Lyndon. Uh, well, we'll get to that with Lyndon and Michelle. We'll I'll introduce those more formally in a few minutes. Uh, but right now, uh, you know, we've been Zooming for a while with this crazy pandemic. Uh, you probably know to keep your mic on mute. Uh, you can use the chat to ask a question or seek clarity. Uh, you can turn your video, uh, you can turn your video on or off. If you have ba low bandwidth, you might want to turn that off. And of course, this webinar is will be recorded and then we'll send a link out to this in a couple of weeks. Let's see, next slide. Uh, before we get to our presenters, I wanted to shout out uh, a big thank you to Sarah Robertson Brown. Did I, is that, is that, that's your new name? Yeah, okay. Even got married during the pandemic. But Sarah has been with us for a long time and been doing a remarkably wonderful job with our outreach and engagement with our Rivers Institute. And she has been a driver and a leader in this uh, storytelling uh, this past year. Uh, uh, Cora was also with us earlier, and I want to give her a little shout of thanks as well. I don't think she's with us tonight, but she's moved on to another new opportunity with uh, giving out money at a foundation as opposed to always having to beg for it. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce our speakers tonight. And as I mentioned, John Shepard will be uh, going over the interactive uh, that, uh, that is developed, uh, but we work very closely with two uh, very strong partners, uh, Lyndon Torstenson, uh, park ranger uh, with the National Park or with MINRA uh, has been engaged with this uh, Big River journey and education for over 20, 25 years. And Michelle is uh, working with the Walk on TP or the Lower Phelan Creek Project. And I believe uh, your title is Education and Communications Coordinator. Uh, I, I know that's uh, the realm of what you're doing and you've been there for a couple of years and it's great to see you uh, growing and taking that role to new, new heights and new levels. So thank you very much for that. Uh, with that, I think we can get started with the, the presentation, and uh, we will be taking questions. You can uh, send those in the chat. I always keep a list, and I'll try to write those down and get back to those, and uh, we'll, we usually try to wrap this up in the hour per time that we have, so uh, that's, uh, that's what we've got. So, John, take it away. 
All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, really great to have a great crowd here on our final webinar of the year. We uh, started this series in November and that one also focused on Dakota culture, looking at um, uh, looking at the Wakan TP site and looking at the Mississippi River more generally. Um, and uh, that was very well attended as well. So really nice bookends to this uh, process. Um, at that time, we had two videos we had developed um, working with Maggie Lawrence, who's the director of the Lower Phelan Creek Project and Wakan TP, uh, and Dr. Kate Bean of the uh, Minnesota, Minnesota Historical Society. <clears throat> Those two videos uh, were kind of our starting point of our collaboration, um, looking at Dakota culture in relationship to the Mississippi River. And since that time, we have built a new interactive experience um, that we're going to be uh, focusing on tonight. But before we jump into that, and I uh, hand this off to my two colleagues, I'm going to just say a few words about the Waters to the Sea, which is kind of our flagship program that we have a, a great deal of content that really is a virtual exploration of the Mississippi River uh, from the headwaters to the Gulf. And um, what we're looking at right here is the main menu page um, of that program. And you can see tabs across the top that, uh, and this is designed for use in the classroom, uh, really targeted for grades four through eight primarily, but used by other grades as well. Um, and uh, it, it uses a map-based interface with very, very rich um, kind of GIS and uh, interactive map elements. So this is um, opening up right now. Uh, what you're seeing is going to see uh, the uh, corridor of the Mississippi from the headwaters to the Gulf. So this program really follows the river from the headwaters to the Gulf of Mexico. There's probably six or seven hours of content, uh, dozens of videos, uh, interactive modules, and you can explore this by uh, zooming in on the map, uh, double clicking it. It's essentially like a Google Earth experience with hot spots uh, along the river. Those are the green dots. Everywhere you see one, there's a story there, a media element that uh, highlights some aspect of our relationship with this great river. Um, and um, there's different ways you can navigate this. I'm not gonna take time to go into that, but uh, Sarah, if you could put the, the link uh, to this into the chat so that folks can explore it on their own. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is kind of showcase one of our new modules that is uh, in, in this program uh, and then uh, I'm going to hand it over to, to Lyndon who's going to do our next piece. So this is a module that we're calling Confluence and it really is um, brings together a number of elements that um, brings to life and allows people to think about and explore this very special area. Um, in which we are so excited to, you know, telling such a strong uh, story of such an important place that is so central um, to our collective history, those of us that live in this region, uh, but also, of course, to the Dakota. This, um, this confluence, uh, which is, as uh, Michelle will talk about, uh, which is known as Bedote, um, is um, thought of as really the, the heart of the Dakota homeland. So we kind of begin these uh, sharing this with that idea that all of us uh, who are here in this region are, are, are on Dakota land. And we're honored to be able to help uh, tell the story, both how uh, the Dakota understand and feel about their relationship to these places, um, but also, uh, you know, how they've enriched, um, enriched our communities, uh, uh, regardless of who we are, who live here now. So this is a module we call Confluence. There are multiple elements. We're gonna be looking closely at the Dakota or the Bedote exploring Dakota lands and waters. I wanna just give you a flavor of uh, one of the, couple of the other elements that are in here. Um, we look very closely at these two rivers, the Mississippi and the Minnesota, how they're different, um, what their water quality is like, um, as they join together um, at the Bedote, at the confluence. Um, we also have some, some interesting pieces that really look at kind of a multi-dimensional look at our relationship with the river um, by focusing in this case on the Ford Dam. So this is, we've zoomed in to the Ford Dam. You can see it at the top of the screen here. This is an island that uh, occurs below that dam. And as I click back and forth, 
I can view this same scene at high water and at low water. And you can see it at high water, the, the island has almost completely disappeared. Uh, whereas at low water, you can see it's uh, visible. And then uh, we've created an interactive um, island walkabout. So we have 360 degree panoramas. This one made at the upstream end of this island. And obviously this is a time of low water since we're able to be on the island. Uh, then we have another one at the other end of the island. Um, looks very different. So uh, a lot of sand, a lot of sediment uh, occurring at the lower end of the island. And as you recall a second ago, we were looking at a gravel um, composition at the upper part of the island. And then we have a 360 degree video. Hopefully this will load quickly. So here we have 360 degree video, kind of a walkabout where you can uh, explore this space. And really our, our questions we ask are, you know, what can we tell, what can we learn about um, this island, how it functions, what, what the uh, ecological elements of this, of this particular place are uh, through this observation of these 360 panoramas, these 360 um, video. So we have, if you continue through this, there are additional questions that uh, get you thinking about uh, those, those ideas. We also have a, a section, we've, we've recreated the experience of going through the lock and dam, kind of the engineering um, piece of that. Uh, we have a 360 video that follows a houseboat through the Ford dam, uh, the Ford lock, which is at the bottom of the screen here. Um, and then we have what we've built as a lock master challenge. So this really has you interacting with, uh, as if you were the lock master controlling how, um, you would lower this barge through uh, through the lock by these different controls. And where you're given some rules about how the lock operates. Um, and um, so we can just begin to explore this. If you make the wrong choice, you will get um, that kind of response. So we can just open the gate here, let the barge in. We have to close the gate. Now we can begin to open uh, the valve to release water down below. So you get the idea. This is uh, kind of a, an experience, a virtual experience of, of uh, playing with some of these features of what actually makes a lock and dam work. So uh, now we've closed that. I believe we'll be able to open the gate. So building these interactive elements that allow you to, to explore these uh, pieces. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to back out again and uh, I'm going to hand the, the, um, the controls over or the, the narration over uh, to Lyndon, who is going to um, walk us through the Big River Journey program. And I'm going to jump back to Waters to the Sea here. And Big River Journey, as he will explain, is a, a program we're very excited to develop with the National Park Service. It's a tab right here. Uh, so I'm gonna click that tab and that's gonna open up Big River Journey. Um, and uh, Lyndon, I'm gonna, uh, just so we can play this at absolute full screen, I'm gonna uh, open it up one more time here so that it will it'll just uh, be a little bigger on the screen, so. All right, so that's my piece. I wanted to just let you know about uh, Waters to the Sea. Sarah will put the link to that program um, in the chat. You're welcome to explore that. And Lyndon, if you would, please uh, walk us through Big River Journey Online. Well, great. Thanks, John. Thanks so much. Uh, and thanks to everyone for your interest in Big River Journey Online and this new cultural module. Um, as uh, John uh, earlier said, or Tracy did, I'm an education specialist for the National Park Service at the Mississippi River and also a licensed teacher and I manage our formal education programs for the National Park Service. I want to provide just a brief introduction to our national park and to the larger program of Big River Journey Online before turning it over to Michelle to show you the new cultural module. So the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area is the only national park with a primary focus on the Mississippi River. The park runs 72 miles along the Mississippi River through the Twin Cities from the Crow River near Anoka through Minneapolis and St. Paul past Hastings to the St. Croix. The park is entirely in Dakota homeland. In this park, the National Park Service manages just a fraction of 1% of the land. That's the federal land that belongs to everyone. 
most of the land is in the hands of local entities like cities and private landowners. So the National Park Service works with partners and thousands of volunteers to care for the land and the water and the other resources in the park and to educate people and students about the park and its meaning and its nationally significant resources, historic, natural, cultural, economic, recreational, and so forth. The National Park Service has no education facilities of our own here, so we collaborate with those that do, like Fort Snelling State Park, Paddleford River Boats, and others. We serve about 26,000 students each year, and I must say the Mississippi River, in my opinion, is the best classroom in America. Big River Journey Online is an outgrowth of Big River Journey which is a science-focused field trip on the Mississippi River for upper elementary students that's combined with four to six weeks of classroom activity, curricula, and training. The purpose of Big River Journey is to connect kids with the river and its wildlife and science and stories and watershed and to provide a foundation for river stewardship while also supporting academic standards. The program's been around for 25 years and normally serves nearly 5,000 students annually on spring and fall boat trips running between St. Paul and Fort Snelling State Park. 12 partner organizations led by the National Park Service collaborate on Big River Journey and partners include the Science Museum, the DNR, Fort Snelling State Park, Audubon Society, Paddleford River Boats, Mississippi Park Connection, Hamlin University and many others. Last spring, we had planned our largest run of Big River Journey ever until the pandemic hit. And suddenly we had to cancel 34 field trips for 3,500 students, 150 teachers in their classes. And while that was plenty tragic, it gave us an opportunity to create some new resources with Hammond University to serve students online, whether they're at home or school or, well, anywhere in the world. And we first created several online modules that correspond to the six science learning stations on board Big River Journey. And we launched that May 1st, 2020. Last fall and winter, we worked to develop the new cultural module with involvement of Lower Phelan Creek Project in Fort Snelling State Park and others. And so I wanna give you a brief orientation right now to the overall site. And let's start with that home screen and let's start with the introductory video. And John, if you would go ahead and click on the introductory video. Welcome to Big River Journey. My name is Lyndon Torstensen, and I'm a park ranger for the National Park Service at the Mississippi River. I'm here at my park called the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area in the Twin Cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. The Mississippi River is one of the greatest rivers in the world and it's one of our country's most important places. That's why part of it right here is a national park. The name Mississippi comes from the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe Indian people and in their language it means big river. No other river has shaped our country like the Mississippi has. It's full of history and stories. It's full of life and it's full of mysteries to be solved. It's a home for amazing birds and wildlife. It's a place for boats and fun recreation. And it's a fantastic place to explore. So join me on Big River Journey and let's get exploring. And I hope that what kids and you get from that is that the Mississippi River is at the heart of our country and it's a fun place to explore. So let's do that. Let's click into welcome aboard and I want to show you the architecture of uh, each of the modules that make up uh, Big River Journey Online. So um, with any of these modules you're going to see in the upper left hand um, an introductory video. In this case, it's an introduction to our national park. It's a three and a half minute video. Right below that are a couple other videos. One is a one minute journey from headwaters to the Gulf, uh, exploring the whole Mississippi River in just one minute. And below that, um, the first of seven selected segments from Mighty Mississippi Virtual Field Trip created by Hamlin University. Along the bottom, you're gonna see a puzzle, a reading, a quiz. These are common elements to each of the modules, but with specific content that's associated with that module. And then uh, Waters to the Sea Go Deeper link, which just links out to the larger Waters to the Sea program. 
Each of the modules is a primary interactive. In this case, it's the watershed uh, interactive and it introduces the concept of a watershed with a clear short video and then allows kids to interact with a, um, this geography of the United States showing the major watersheds or basins uh, on uh, our country and featuring the Mississippi watershed as dominant in the middle of our country. Let's click the menu item, which will, or the menu um, link there, which will bring us back to the home screen and click on to disappearing waterfall, one of the other modules. And here, once again, you're gonna see the same kind of architecture and introduction um, to this module in the upper left-hand corner with other um, videos below it that have more substantial content and then an interactive. And I just wanna show you this as an example of the interactive. So we'll click under that, which happens to be a 360 panorama of um, the St. Anthony Falls area. And you can explore around there and you can click on some hot links to learn more about St. Anthony Falls or the lock. You can click on to uh, a video that's embedded in the lock to show you what it's like to canoe through the lock if you were able to do that now. But we'll just close out of that. Just wanted to show you that example of one of the kinds of interactives. We'll click on the menu item to go back into the main, uh, the main menu. And go ahead and click on bugs and water quality for just one more sample of an interactive here. Again, there's an introductory video in the upper left, but we're gonna click on the water quality lab. And if we do that, we're gonna see first of all, step one, which is a water quality slideshow that introduces you to um, aquatic macroinvertebrates. Go ahead and click on that just for fun. And, and that will, if you follow through, you're going to learn about what are aquatic macroinvertebrates and how can they tell us about um, whether water is dirty or clean. We'll go ahead and escape out of that. Um, but having learned that, then we'll go on to step two, testing the waters. And you'll see some prominent red dots here that just help us, first of all, to get oriented on our Twin Cities. And you can see the direction of flow of each of the rivers, where the Mississippi River is and the other major tributaries. We'll click Continue and then click on to the Minnesota-Mississippi Confluence, where we're challenged to determine which of these rivers, the Mississippi or the Minnesota, has better water quality. So we'll click on Test Site number one and um, then follow the prompts uh, clicking on the vial, clicking on the Petri dish, and then um, we can associate each of those aquatic invertebrates with which class they belong in. The, whether the bugs hey, are those right. that can tolerate pollution or cannot tolerate pollution. And depending on what kind of aquatic invertebrates we find, yes. we can learn whether the water is dirty or clean. So in this case, hey, uh, we right. have class two and three. Oh, here's a class one. And with that reinforcement, we can assess our water quality. Now, yes, it's a limited um, survey, but we can click assessment and make our guess as to whether that's excellent or poor or in between. We notice that one of the aquatic invertebrates, the mayfly, belongs in class one that can't tolerate pollution. And so we have a clue there that, well, it can't be too bad. Maybe we can try good um, and see how that compares to what the experts say. And then we would, we would um, run that same sort of test for the Minnesota River and see which of the rivers is um, uh, a better water quality. So that's kind of a quick survey. We'll escape out of there. Quick survey of um, some of the, um, the uh, modules within Big River Journey Online. I just want to click on one other thing feature here, and that is the four teachers, the tow boat. And in the teacher resources, there are a set of assessments, assessments for each of the modules. And, and then there's assessment answer keys. Now, we don't let just anybody have those answer keys, but you all are special people. So I will put into the chat um, the uh, passwords um, for that. Um, but in that screen, <laughs> yeah, you're not authorized, John. Um, there, are, There's also a teacher feedback survey um, form, which we'd love to have you complete once you've had some experience with Big River Journey Online. There are other um, resources below, including River Facts and vocabulary words for, for the various 
um, modules. Um, at the bottom, there is a link for standards as well. So if you're interested in what standards are associated with which modules, you can get some of that information right there. We'll click on the menu once again. And at this point, uh, we'll go back to the Confluence of Cultures module. And uh, so once again, we're gonna be presented with this screen. And I must say, this has become my favorite module. And I wanna um, pass the baton over to Michelle at this point to um, go through this module with you in some detail. And I wanna just express such gratitude to Michelle and to uh, Maggie Lawrence from the Lower Failing Creek Project for their uh, work on this module with us. It couldn't have happened without them. So, Michelle. Hami dakli api chante washte na pechi za pie. Michelle Bowman amaki api e si situan kawak peton ayate himata ha tamakota dayaya hippi. Um, hello, my relatives. My name is Michelle. I am Dakota um, of the Sisituan Kawakpetun Oyate. Um, I work for a native led environmental nonprofit here in the east side of St. Paul called Lower Phelan Creek Project. We um, have a mission to engage people to honor and care for our sacred sites and the cultural value within them. So, um, we were equally as excited to get the opportunity to work with Hamlin and the National Park Service on this beautiful um, confluence of cultures module that we have here. And um, it was a beautiful coming together of a lot of community members, um, just piecing together stories and knowledge that we have. A couple times during our presentation tonight, we've been talking about how um, we all exist on Dakota land. Um, but a lot of times I feel our community doesn't really know what that means. Um, and I mean community as in all of us. And so one way that we can get a better understanding of what it means to live on Dakota homelands is through um, sharing our stories. And so we have the Confluence of Cultures module here. Um, and um, in this upper left-hand corner, we have a sort of introductory video to the module. Um, here we are um, by Kao Tao, an interpretive naturalist for Fort Snelling Park. And um, in this video, Kao sort of goes into um, the importance of telling these stories from a cultural perspective and what that means for our relationship to the river. Um, and actually, you know, for the interest of time, I think I might just show you these elements because there's so many elements in all of these modules and I want everyone um, to, to have a really beautiful understanding of it. But um, so we have this introductory video up here. Um, the second one on the left is more of a timeline. So um, as a group, we were able to, oh geez, now it's not gonna load, I bet. <laughs> But we were able to um, put together, piece together a brief timeline that talks a little bit about different Dakota um, um, important dates and times, as well as other communities. So, you know, for example, um, this one talks a little bit about um, Oheawahi, Pilot Knob, and just, you know, following the timeline what this looks like. Here's Wakantipi. So um, Lower Phelan Creek Project, we directly work out of Wakantipi. And this is really just talking about um, the cave that we is now is located in Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary and how this is a sacred site for us. Um, but as history and colonization and settler colonialism progressed, um, unfortunately, our sacred site was destroyed with dynamite. Um, and so, um, you know, this just talks a lot about, you know, following the history. Here we have the Dakota War of 1862. Um, and of course, we do talk about our um, Black relatives and our immigrant relatives, um, our Hmong relatives um, in this timeline and relationships to the river. 
Um, so that is a really good learning um, opportunity for everyone. Here we have a brief video um, from Dr. Kate Bean um, talking about Minnesota as Dakota sacred waters. But um, I think we can all view that on ourselves. And then we have a beautiful reading here from Ramona Quito Stately um, about her family's story at Bedote or at Fort Snelling. Um, and there is a video version to click on and a PDF version of that story. Um, other elements like a puzzle and a quiz. But my absolute favorite element of this module is the exploring Dakota lands and waters. Um, also, in the interest of time, I will probably just pick a few that are, are really meaningful and impactful. But um, we worked really, really closely with John um, on developing this map that was created by Dakota artist Marlena Miles to make it an interpretive map. So, what is just incredibly impactful about this is that it is Dakota people telling Dakota stories on Dakota lands. And while that might seem a little bit redundant, it is just, it is groundbreaking to have a um, education platform like this because oftentimes our stories aren't told by our own community or by our own people. Oftentimes when we hear about Dakota lands and waterways, they come from a historical and Western perspective. Um, but here we have um, what I could click on a Hana Wichahapi, which is um, Indian Mounds Park, so a burial site for a lot of our relatives. And the way that this map works as an interactive is that you would click on each one of these sites and it will bring you to um, a video that you can then click on and hear stories from our community um, talking about these places. When I... Can everybody hear that? come here to the mounds and to walk on TV, I feel like it, it brings me to a different place, I think, um, in my in my being. I feel more centered, more grounded. It allows me to let everything that might be bothering me or just things that are really not as significant, right? Um, a lot of times in daily life, we get really caught up in things that in the big picture really aren't that big of a deal. And when I come to places like this, it's almost like that power. I mean, that's what sacred sites are. They're these places of power and you can feel it here. And you feel that bigness, that big sacred feeling that takes all those other meaningless little things away and it allows you to reconnect with yourself and your spirit and be more centered and grounded and that's why I feel so lucky that I get to do this work and that I live so close to this area and I can come and visit um, and feel that when I need to. My connection to the mounds is this is the original homelands of the Dakota people and you know people have reservations that they live on but this is like the original place and when I'm here I feel like a sense of empowerment and like um, you know my ancestors were here walking one time and now I'm here and they're buried in those mounds and when I'm here I just feel powerful and like you know strong and happy. And, and if you're having like a bad day and you come here, sometimes it can really help just to walk around. When I come to visit here, I have to drive over my ancestors and it, it, it forces us to be part of that, that disrespect or that desecration, even though we're coming here for a respectful season. So I, I shared that one because it is a relatively short one, um, but this entire um, map is full of stories um, from our communities. Um, this one is a beautiful one of um, the reclamation of Bade Makaska. And growing up, I always had um, relatives tell me that um, you know, the land loves to hear the language. Our people have been here for thousands and thousands of years, and we learned our language for, from the plants and the animals and the land. And so when we're able 
to speak our language back to these back into these places um, the land really appreciates that and another element of this map that is quite beautiful is that um, Madison Hand, who is Lakota and Dakota, um, she was so willing to give us pronunciation clips. And so you can click on these little microphones next to the names of these places of our sacred sites and learn how to pronounce them. Bodote. Owamani Omani. Gop Ozia. I remember when um, Badema Kaska, the name of that lake, um, was returned. And I heard a lot of community members um, feeling a little bit anxious about being able to properly pronounce it. But with um, learning opportunities like this, it makes those things possible. And even if you mispronounce the names of our sacred sites or our special places, you're trying. And not only do our people appreciate it, but the land appreciates it as well. Um, this uh, this one is about Bodote, and we have a couple different videos on the importance of Bodote as um, the point of origin for Dakota people. Um, and then, of course, we have one about the Wakpatanka or the Mississippi River featuring Kate Bean and an illustration done also by Marlena Miles and Jim Rock. And then we, we have some about Wakantipi, which is the sacred site that um, Lower Phelan Creek Project that our work um, organizes around. And I, oh, I accidentally exited out of it. Um, I did want to share one more, one more video. Which one was it? I think it was, I think it was this one. This greeting is Yahi, and it translates to it is good you are here. So it's just a, a greeting for all people that come to this place. The Dakota people, we've got our original instructions from the land, from the water, the wind, from this Minnesota Makote. And so this was always a place of uh, changes, this Padema Kaska, places that changed, people that changed, the landscape, and today it's still changing. Yahi. A welcome greeting for everybody that comes to visit this lake, Indigenous, non-Indigenous. I can't but help smile <laughs> hearing little ones pronounce uh, the names of our places. Um, I share that that video too because um, in our cultural and spiritual way of being, we have a a word or a phrase midakuye oyasi, which means um, it's a way to greet all of our relations. But essentially, it's talking to how, in our way of being, we believe that we're all related. So we're related to the Wapatanka, the Mississippi River. We're related to those plants out there. We're related in this room that, or virtual room, I should say, that we are in here. And, you know, before I, I pose the question of what does it mean to be living on, on Dakota lands and what sense of responsibility does that invoke in all of us? And, um, you know, this collaboration came as a piecing together of stories, of Dakota stories from Dakota people, but also the stories of all the people who live here. Um, if we are to view the river and each other as relatives, we have a responsibility to take care of each other. 
And that is what is so important and impactful about modules like this, learning opportunities that offer opportunities for, for our, our Wakanhej, our, our young ones, and our teachers, our educators, to share these stories and to share these lessons. Um, we all know that we love the lands and waters and the environment, and we are in a time where protecting them and nurturing them is of the utmost importance. And one of the ways we can do that is to learn their stories and to learn their names, um, which is why I'm so, so, so humbled and thankful to be able to, to share some of these with you. And it wouldn't have been possible without the help of Hamlin and the National Park Service and all of the people who allowed us to share their stories. Here we have a, a quick credits and acknowledgments, but it's not very that it's not that quick. It's full of all these people in the community who want these stories shared. Um, Mona Smith. Uh, Ramona, Marlena Miles, all these people gave us permission to use their artwork to share these stories because um, there is a statistic out there um, that Native people in what we call Turtle Island or the United States, one of our biggest forms of racism that we're facing is invisibility. Um, but thankfully, we have amazing people in our community that are working so tirelessly to combat that and educators who are wanting to share these stories and everyone who's here tonight. Um, I just extend a really large pidamayaye. Thank you so much. Um, and just, you know, as you can see, please, please, please explore more into the module. There is so much I wasn't even able to cover within my brief time frame. But um, this reading that we have here is incredibly beautiful. Um, you can use it, um, all the things in this module, to teach your young ones, your, your kiddos, your students, and then, you know, further that education with these um, other learning opportunities, like this word search puzzle or this quiz that we have here. Um, and there's just a plethora of videos and stories to be shared and told. And I might even be able to wrap it up a couple minutes early. Otherwise, usually I ramble for quite a while. <laughs> um, but I think... I think I, I think I covered most of it. John or Lyndon, is there anything else in the confluence of cultures that we want to share briefly? You know, maybe um, if you want to share the, uh, play the video uh, with um, Leonard Wabasha, just to um, hear him talk about. Um, yeah. It's this first one, correct? Yes. yes. Awesome. Yeah, that's a beautiful one as well. This is the center of the universe, the center of all things. We are at a place that my people, the Dakota, call Bodote. This particular Bodote is very significant to uh, many, many of the Dakota people because they believe that this is the spot where the creator made us. He used parts of everything that you can see around us here, the trees, soil, some of the fish, some of the birds that are flying by. That's one of the reasons why we have this connectedness to all things. <coughs> Everything is related. We 
used the, the river valleys as uh, our homes because we had fresh water right there. Uh, we had the use of the river where we could fish, we could gather wild rice, and we could travel almost anywhere as far south as the Gulf of Mexico, as far east as the Ohio River Valley, as far west as the Rocky Mountains, up all the tributaries that bleed into the Mississippi River. We could find locations where maple trees grew. We could do sugar mapling in the springtime. The water, of course, is sacred, but all water is sacred. We believe that the, the water is, in a way, the blood of Mother Earth, and, and it helps everything to sustain. Everything is a life. All things have spirit, even the rock. Respect these things because it's all we have to fall back on. So, you know, this whole map is just full of videos like that. And I wish we could play them all, <laughs> um, but there's a good thing that um, it's online so that we can come back to them whenever we want. Um, but that essentially is what the Confluence of Cultures module is. And I am, thank you for giving me the time to share a little bit about that. Michelle, thank you so very much. And Lyndon and John, uh, it's remarkable to have uh, you folks working together on this. Uh, but Michelle, I think you hit the nail on the head in the sense that there were so many other people involved and gave so much. Uh, Mona Smith just did a remarkable job and wouldn't take a, a dime for her work. And she, I know she, she what we were going to pay her, she gave back to you folks, mm -hmm. which is just so wonderful because your organization is doing some remarkable things as well. So I think we could talk a little bit about that as we're going along as well. But this is a tool that is here to be used. It is free to the public. It is free to be engaged with. And uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come up. And I have a couple. I always get to throw out a few myself. But we'll take one from Monica. And this is a, a, a good maybe a, well, way to get started. Why uh, this being Dakota land, um, uh, I think what we're talking about, this, this very sense of place, this, this, this uh, Bedote, uh, does the river take the name of Anishinaabe people? So that uh, that's a question. Uh, and our illustrious panel, would anyone like to uh, answer that? One of the uh, largest misconceptions about Native people is that we don't move. <laughs> um, but historically and currently, um, we're... We have two legs, we move. Um, and, uh, you know, these are Dakota homelands, but the Anishinaabe Ojibwe people, they had a prophecy. Hmm. And I apologize if I, if I get this incorrect, because um, those are not my, my stories. However, they had a prophecy that said, um, you know, traditionally they come out east or they're from out east, but their prophecy told them, um, to follow or to, to move where the wild rice grows on, on the water. And so they came here. And, you know, the Mississippi is so large and so big and so grand, um, pretty much hun like hundreds of different tribal nations have different names for, for these waterways. Um, and oftentimes it, it just comes down to, um, what Euro-American um, explorer or settler documented it first um, and what was published. And then those are usually the names that get taken on. But it's really, that brings up a really good question of, um, you know, the one of the introduction videos to the, the cultural um, module talks about how there are so many Dakota names um, of towns in Minnesota. It, like the, the, the word for Minnesota, Minnesota, that's a Dakota name. Um, but talking about a lot of the suburbs, Chanhassen, Chanhassen, Wyzetta, Waziata. Um, I could go on and on and on and on. But 
oftentimes the names that we have for places, it just, it, it depends on what, um, who documented it way back in the day and, and how that got published. But yeah. I can guarantee you there are hundreds of names for the river. <laughs> yes, and even a little more focused is that the French were coming in uh, as the early uh, uh, Europeans that were engaging uh, through the Lake Superior uh, waterways uh, and that uh, they would have probably come into contact, well, they came into contact with the Anishinaabe before they came into contact with the Dakota. So that uh, you, you hit the nail, you were, you're right about that, that, that I believe that you could say the, the French probably were engaged with that. And then whoever gets to write the map kind of writes to tell the story to begin with. And they developed some of the first maps of this area. Uh, here is a question from Josh Leonard. Uh, there are wonderful Native American perspectives in the new Minnesota State Science Standards. Some non-Native, uh, including many white teachers, can feel like they are not supposed to teach Native American stories if they are not Native themselves. How can we encourage non-Native teachers to share these stories without appropriating those stories? Um, what comes to mind just right off the bat would be um, sharing stories that come from our community directly. So like this, this great resource that we're talking about today is a really wonderful way to, to share stories about our community but that are from our community that you're just elevating and uplifting. Another good way that I have been in conversation with teachers and folks who are um, really wanting to teach more about our histories and our current uh, presence here, as well as you know what we're doing. We have, did you know that the, the Twin Cities is the third largest populated area of native people in the United States? And so we have so many people on the ground working in nonprofits, native businesses, and governments doing incredible work. But again, it's just about elevating that and, and shining a light. Um, I will say it again, but the, the modern form of racism for native people is invisibility. So doing what we can to elevate and uplift the stories and the work that we're doing is a really wonderful um, a way to combat that. To get more directly to the <laughs> to the question, um, you know, intentions matter. If you're doing things in a good way, that matters. But oftentimes, um, it can be uncomfortable to, to teach about a culture you're not familiar with. So if that is something you're experiencing, I always recommend reaching out to different Native organizations, Native teachers, and inviting them to your classroom to talk. But remember to, to please um, try to tap into any funds that you may have um, because it's 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 a lot of labor for us sometimes to have to talk about traumas and history and things like that. So if you are able to um, monetarily support a speaker to come in, I think that is one of the best ways that you can um, have authentic and accurate um, information and education that is coming directly from our communities into your into your education and schooling systems. Um, I do have a question about uh, how many uh, Native uh, speakers, how many uh, Dakota Native speakers are in Minnesota, or maybe what is the state of the language uh, in our state? Yeah, in, in Minnesota specifically, it is pretty low. Um, unfortunately, too, the pandemic has taken a lot of our elders. Um, COVID has hit our community harder than any other demographic. Um, and unfortunately, it has been taking a lot of our fluent speakers and our elders. Um, I'm not quite exactly sure on the numbers. A couple years ago, it was um, around a thousand, I think. Um, I could be completely wrong, though. Um, but all I know is that it's pretty low. But in the same sense, we are we are um, having such an influx of second language learners um, coming in and people who are just so dedicated and willing and wanting to pick up the language and learn the language. Um, but with that comes having to deal with a lot of um, historical trauma um, happening from boarding school eras. Um, so there's a there's a lot of healing to be done. But our language is healing, so yeah. Uh, one of the questions, the, the question from Josh about um, 
how to uh, engage, how to not appropriate. Uh, I, I believe um, Dan McGinnis, uh, who helped us make the connection with you folks, talked about learning how to become an ally, which I thought was a nice way of, uh, you know, and that seemed to have a lot to do with listening. Uh, but with that in mind, uh, can you talk a bit about your work with Phelan Creek? Uh, I believe that you're in the process of uh, securing the funds to create an interpretive center. Uh, the idea of, of uh, folks coming there uh, to learn, to engage, the idea of professional development so you're feeling more comfortable. Talk maybe a bit about what, you, what the vision of that center is and what it might provide uh, educators and the public in, this, uh, in the Twin Cities. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, we are a native-led environmental nonprofit in St. Paul called Lower Phelan Creek Project, um, but soon to have our own interpretive center called Wakantipi Center. And Wakantipi, that word in our language, it means dwelling place of the sacred. And it's talking about this um, cave that is in what's now called Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary right next to the Mississippi River in Indian Mounds Regional Park. Um, and that was a place our ancestors would go to have ceremony. People would come and gather in that place to um, hold meetings and, and gatherings with each other. But it was also a place that our relatives returned to bury past on loved ones up above in the mounds. And so our hope in, in building this uh, center is that what we've learned is unfortunately a lot of people don't know about this history. A lot of people don't know about this story and a lot of people don't often know about our sacred sites. And even more so um, with the coming of the Euro-American settlers and industrialism, a lot of our sacred sites were looted and destroyed. Um, and that is the case with Wakanti BK that was blasted in with three, me three meters in with dynamite. Um, and that is uh, really close to our, and a lot, you know, like that happened with the mounds too. Our mounds were, were looted and our remain, our, the burial remains were um, compromised and tampered with. And so our hopes for building this center is to tell um, that story and to talk a little bit more about what it means for us to be Dakota. What are our values? Um, and just talk a little bit more about um yeah, like our, our sacred sites and our relationship to these spaces. Um, unfortunately and fortunately, we've been able to do a lot of work in restoration. So um, even though our sacred site was destroyed and it became an unofficial sitting dump, city dumping ground for quite some time, uh, we were able to completely um, restore that area to be six thriving ecosystems. So we do a really good job of, of being intentional on taking care of the lands and waters um, rooted in our values of all of our relations, like um, Leonard Wabasha said in that video. And our hope for educators and for the community is um, would be to be able to come to this space to learn a little bit um, about our stories and then leave with a better understanding of Dakota people, our presence here, our future here, but also what it means to be a good relative. Um, a lot of times, or the reason we had to do all this restoration um, and retake care of the lands and waterways is because, um, you know, as humans and, and, and the way that our society is right now, it doesn't value being good relatives to the land and to the water and to each other. And so um, we really hope this center um, can help elevate that because, you know, we're all sort of in in this together. And as climate change continues and as um, the world sort of continues to be um, uncertain, to say the least. Um, we all need to be good relatives to each other and to the land and to the water. And so that was a really long, long explanation, but I hope I answered your question. I think it was very good. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. And, and this one's from John. Uh, he has got the question of, do you encourage people to visit Badote? That is a good, good question. You know, sometimes I, I get hard questions and I, I revert to my, my answer of I'm just one person and I don't represent our whole nation. 
but it is of my personal opinion and recommendation that whenever we visit Dakota sacred sites, it's important that we go there in, in a good way um, and that we don't go there with bad feelings, um, especially to our sacred sites because they hold on, our spirits, our, our relatives, our ancestors, our sacred spirits are there. And so it's important for us to go there in a good way. Um, I think there are, our areas of Bedote, I wouldn't necessarily recommend people going to, for example, um, the area that is close to where all of our children, women, and elders um, died at the concentration camp there. So I don't necessarily recommend people going over there unless you're, you're Dakota or unless you're Native um, to pay your respects. But in general, that area is really beautiful. Um, and I think if you go there in a good way, it is appropriate. Very good. Very good. Well, I guess we're, we're going to, um, well, I'm just going to, Aaron had sent in a question. We'll give, since he got here, we'll, we'll honor that question. Uh, are there any resources uh, or histories available about uh, stories that detail Dakota use of the Mississippi Gorge, specifically mm -hmm. stretching, and I cannot say the word, uh, uh, so I'm not even going to try, but uh, I assume from the upper gorge down to Bedote, uh, perhaps specifically involving the springs along the way or sacred sites. Mm, related to Unkehi. Um Resources. Um, Paul Duran's map is a really wonderful resource. Um, I don't think it talks about stories. However, it is a really detailed map of all the Dakota names. Um, in this region. I would also recommend Minisotamakoche. Um, I feel like I have it somewhere around here, um, but it's written by Gwen Westerman and Glenn Washichuna. Um, and it had, now it's gonna bother me. I'll find it one second. <laughs> um, here it is. Um, this book, uh, Minnesota Makoche, the land of the Dakota. Um, it is a really, really beautiful and, okay, perfect. So you already know that one. Okay. Um, other than that, um, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, in terms of educational purposes, reaching out to the tribal historic preservation officers for all of the four recognized Dakota tribes in the area is always, always, always a good place to turn. They are um, incredibly maxed all the time, but they might be able to recommend some resources or um, a general direction if you are looking for specific um, teachings or stories. Well, very good. Well, I'm going to wrap this up right now. Uh, 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 Kim had sent a note, and it's really more of a statement. She says, every time I sit in on these, these seminars, I see how Rivers to the Sea has grown, and uh, commitment, I'm grateful for the commitment to add the voices that make it um, uh, rich and valuable. And I, I appreciate that. We have been working on this project for 20 years. It's a bit like Leaves of Grass, where you start writing something and it gets uh, more interesting and more uh, layers and more levels to tell the stories. Um, but what I certainly think, and from our framework of the center, the connections of systems and people and culture are gonna be critical, uh, in not just having the best science to solve problems, but we need the best attitude and relationships. So we really do appreciate the opportunity that we have to pull this together, to tell these stories and to work with a wide range of folks in our community. So with that, I would like to thank Michela, Lyndon and John for your help with this. And then we do have, uh, uh, if you have other questions, please contact us at our website, uh, at our, our, C our cge.hamlin.edu. Uh, we will, we always wanna send out emails and evaluate a survey. So if you get that, please respond so we can make these uh, tools better uh, and get folks to engage. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we have two ways to learn to, uh, to, to uh, engage. One is with the Mississippi River Delta Institute that's looking at the, the, the voice of the South. There's so many rich stories there. We have a lot of Native American voices in that as well. Uh, in fact, that's one of the places where a whole community uh, of the Homa Indian 
uh, are being uh, moved because of climate change. One of the first folks uh, to actually have to make that move. Uh, and then we have the Mississippi Rivers Institute uh, in, in July. And Anissa, uh, so I do the question about how do you get to learn how to use tools? Well, get training and talk to people, engage. And these are two ways to do it. There's so many other good organizations doing education and outreach as well as, as our center, of course. Uh, and we can have the ability, if you're interested to receive a continuing education credit, uh, fill out that form and then Sarah can kind of will guide you through that. Um, so without any uh, further ado, I were a little bit after seven. I would like to thank you uh, for coming and attending. Uh, we are super excited about doing this again next year. We are going to focus uh, on the Mississippi River again. There's so many stories to be told and uh, work with a few stories from the center of the river uh, in, the, uh, in the beautiful, rich uh, uh, center of our country. So with that said, I will thank you. Uh, you are welcome to stay around and have a little informal chat. And uh, uh, I see some good, friendly and familiar faces. So uh, I'm going to officially end this presentation and anything